Um, this morning, our scripture reading is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. If you could please open your Bibles with me as we read together. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I read from the New International Version, and it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Glad to be here. Um, this morning we have a treat. Uh, as you know, we are in the midst of our pastoral search. And as part of the process uh, we are going, we have invited Pastor Ty Davis, who comes to us from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, and we got to meet his lovely wife, uh, Cambria, who's back there. And they have a little six-month-old, uh, Kailani. Did I say that right? Kailani, so uh, they're joining us today uh, as far as kind of just learning to get to know us and we get to know him. Uh, so Pastor Davis, uh, welcome to the Scasso Thunderbird Church. I know we will be blessed. Do you have the joy of Jesus in your hearts this morning? Yes. Amen. So do I, and it is a joy for Cambria and me to be here this weekend with you and uh, enjoying the heat while there's rain back at home. So, fully on them, right? We've really enjoyed the uh, hospitality of the people that we've met here and uh, getting to know y'all, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing the blessings of God as we continue forward. You know, the passage of Scripture that uh, was just read a minute ago from Hebrews chapter 12 is a passage of Scripture that's become very important in my life because it's spoken deeply to my soul, and I want to share that with you this morning in a little bit why. And as you know, the passage of Scripture, as you just heard, begins with a cloud, and I am infatuated with clouds. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but I really like clouds. I find them to be fascinating. Just the other day, I, I texted my wife as I was driving to the church for a meeting, and I said, quick, go outside and look at the clouds, and I was so disappointed when an hour later she texted back and said, I just got this. It's dark now. The clouds were amazing. They were, there was a ripple effect across the sky, and they were beautiful. I remember as a kid, I would go down to the airport, and I would lay down in the grass, and I would watch when the airplanes weren't coming in. I'd watch the clouds go overhead, and you could watch them move, and you'd wonder how fast the wind was going up there. I'm infatuated with clouds. It's a true story. Well, I'm a pilot, and I remember when I first started my pilot's training, there was one thing that I was told, above everything else, until you get your instrument rating, do not go close to the clouds. Clouds are bad. They're dangerous. You get into a cloud, and within three seconds, you can lose your orientation, and you pff, die. Well, I particularly like life, so I didn't want to die, and I thought, that's good advice. Stay away from the clouds. Stay away from the clouds. Stay away from the clouds. The very first time that I flew an airplane solo, I took off. It was a beautiful day in Walla Walla, Washington. That's where I grew up. And as I took off, oh, I hear a couple little cheers. Yeah, good work. As I took off, the clouds were nowhere to be seen. And I moseyed along, and something happened. As I took off, the door on the other side of the airplane popped open. I don't know how that happened. I really don't, but it scared me. So I got the plane all trimmed out, got everything level and everything you know, good, good to go. And I reached over, and I grabbed the door, and I pushed it out. Boom! I shut it really hard. And my door popped open. And that was even more scary. I looked down, yikes, that's not good. So I reached over here, boom, shut down. And this one popped open again. So I, un I took off my seatbelt. I scooted to the center of the airplane. I grabbed both doors like this. It was just a little Cessna 150. And I closed them both at the same time. Now, in the course of all of that going on, 
On my first solo flight, I suddenly found myself in the center of a cloud. And I was terrified. I thought, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. That's what they all told me, I'm going to die. I was able to very easily turn it around and head back to the airport, and that was the end of my solo flight for that day. I was shaken up a little bit, and I, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to fly in, which I did. I love flying airplanes. And I remember later on, after I had gotten my pilot's license, I began some instrument training. I, I'm not an instrument-rated pilot, but I began some instrument training with a guy named Kevin out of Andrews University, and he said one day, it's cloudy. You want to go up above the clouds? Yes, I want to go up above the clouds. It was beautiful to climb up out of the gray dreariness of Berrien Springs and see the sunshine break open. I love clouds, and I'm still in fashion. You know, one of the reasons why I want to get my instrument rating is because I want to fly through them. They're beautiful. And this passage talks about clouds. But in the process of talking about clouds, it also talks about running a race. That is much less interesting to me, this running a race business. But I went to school in Germany for one year, and while I was in school in Germany, I found a very short-lived interest in running. There was a girl that went to school there, and she was constantly nagging at me every day, you should go running, you should go running. And then she thought I should go kickboxing, and I thought, okay, fine, I'll try running. So I started running a, a route that was about two kilometers, a kilometer out, a kilometer back. This was in Germany, so I did everything in, in Ks, you know, no miles per hour or anything like that. So I'd run a kilometer out, a kilometer back, and I thought, well, this isn't too bad. I can, I can do that. So I thought I'd try a little bit further. So I, was, I started running to this bridge down at the freeway, and it was about five kilometers there and five kilometers back, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Now, that was a long time ago. But I felt pretty good about running my 10 kilometers. And then I started learning about marathons. I have never run a marathon. Don't know if I ever will. Marathons scare me. That's a lot of running. Anybody here ever run a marathon? Okay, we got a couple people. Back, okay, a couple more over here. You know, back, back in North Idaho, there are a ton of people who are into racing. And uh, we have about, uh, I think, six or seven people in my church that are Iron Men. They have done the Iron Man race, and they are into big time running and different kinds of racing. And I think about the quote from Barry Maggie, who was a, an Olympic marathon runner. He was a bronze medalist, not a gold medalist, but he was a bronze medalist. And, and he says this, this phrase, this quote, in which he says, anyone can run 20 miles. And I hear that, and I think, oh, that's the biggest joke of the day. <laughs> I don't think I can run 20 miles. But when you understand marathons, which I know just the tip of the iceberg about in theory, you begin to understand why Barry says anyone can run 20 miles, because a marathon is 26.2 miles, right? Marathon runners, 26.2. If you see that sticker on the back of somebody's car that says 26.2, you can assume they're a runner. Or 13.1, they're a half a runner. I want a 0.0, .0 sticker, but I haven't had the, the, the courage to put it on my car yet. I'm not that brave. Anyone can run 20 miles, and Barry says this as someone who knows that a marathon is 26.2 miles. Apparently what happens is right around mile 20 in a marathon, and you can confirm this later for me if, you, if you'd like, around mile 20, a lot of runners hit a wall. Their glycogen stores that they've been, they've been getting all ready for this race, they begin to deplete their energy begins to decrease, and they hit this wall right around mile 20. And that last 6.2 miles, as Barry finishes the quote, he says, it's those six miles that count. The author of Hebrews says that as Christians, every one of us is running a race. And perhaps you find yourself hitting around mile 20, from time to time. You feel that depletion of your energy, the depletion of your spiritual stores beginning to occur in your life. And it's a race in which we begin to realize desperately needs perseverance. And there are days 
at least in my life, and maybe you're all better Christians than I am, there are days in my life where I begin to think, I'm not sure I can put one foot in front of the other again. Perhaps you have become spiritually glycogen depleted. And in our text, in the, con in the context of running this race with perseverance, the author of Hebrews tells us to look at Jesus. But not just to look at him. I know people who will glance at Jesus once in a while and continue on life's journey. But the author of Hebrews tells us to fix our eyes on him. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, run the race marked out before you with perseverance. And I know, as I talk to Christians, and in my own Christian walk, I know that fixing your eyes on someone that you can't see, at least physically, can be a difficult thing to do. Is that true for you? Fixing your eyes on an invisible being, as far as we have experienced, it can be a difficult thing to do. And sometimes when I hear people say that, I go, oh, there's that spiritual jibber-jabber again, fixing your eyes on Jesus. It can be difficult, especially when times are tough, to keep our eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of our faith. And that's where the cloud comes in. You see, all of Hebrews chapter 12, the idea of running a race with our eyes fixed on Jesus, and everything that comes after those first three verses in Hebrews chapter 12, all of it is based on Hebrews chapter 11. And you know that because in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, there's a very important word. And for those of you who consider yourself students of the Bible, you have to understand the word, therefore. Therefore, always means that something preceding this particular verse is of utmost importance. And if you read Hebrews chapter 12, in and of itself, you miss a great blessing that comes in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, you remember those words, therefore, because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And if you read that in itself, it might not make so much sense, but you back up to Hebrews chapter 11, and you find there what a lot of Christians call the hall of faith. Have you heard that term before? The hall of faith. It is a list of people, one after another, that the author of Hebrews lists as people that we can look to to be examples in our lives of what it's like to live a life of faith, to run the race with perseverance when we ourselves might feel like that is a difficult thing to do. When you read through Hebrews chapter 11 and you read the stories about Everyone from Abraham down to people like Samson, who we wonder, how did he get into that chapter of the Bible? I spent a lot of time thinking about that one. There are people that we can look to as people who are examples of running the race with perseverance, with their eyes fixed on Jesus. They are people who are cheering you along the course that you're running. And you know, as I read through Hebrews chapter 11, as I get ready to dive into Hebrews chapter 12, I think of something. I, I think to myself, the author of Hebrews really messed up because he left out a lot of people that belong in Hebrews chapter 11. But I'll cut him a little bit of slack because a lot of those people weren't even born yet. What do I mean by that? People who belong in the hall of faith, people who are a part of the great cloud of witnesses, can include the people that are sitting right next to you in the pew today. They could be some of your teachers from school, your mentors as you start your first job, they can be grandparents who have pointed you to Jesus with the example of their lives in which they have experienced struggle and then awesome wonders in the name of God. There are many people around us that we fail to remember from time to time that they are people who belong in the hall of faith and they are a part of our cloud 
of witnesses. And perhaps if I take it just a step further, you are invited to be a part of the cloud of witnesses for others. Take a look at the people sitting next to you for just a minute. You don't have to be too obnoxious about it. But just take a look at the people sitting around you. Reflect, maybe even with your eyes closed for just a minute, of the people in your life that pointed you to Jesus in one way or another. I've met a lot of people who think that they can walk the Christian walk, live the Christian life on their own. And I can tell you very, very clearly, and many of you can probably tell me this as well from your own experience, that many of the people who think that they can live the Christian life on their own are unhappy people. Have you ever met a Sadventist? Yeah. You know, people who are unhappy and do not experience the joy of Jesus in their lives are often lonely. They're doing Christianity on their own. And I want you to know today that I believe very, very strongly in Christian community. I believe that the only way that we are called to do Christianity is in the context of community. And I know that there's introverts out there. My wife is one of them. And sometimes we need a little bit of a break. I'm not one of those people. But sometimes we need a little bit of break from people, and that's okay. But unless we continue to live in the context of community, we're not doing Christianity according to Jesus' intention for our life. I know people who say, I'll be part of a community when it suits me, when it works well for me, when I need it. And the truth is that I know a lot of people who wish that the people with those attitudes would be there for them. I know a lot of lonely Christians. And one of the things that brings me great joy is to watch them find community and discover that Christ has so much more for them. So today, what I want to do for the rest of our time together, as I share with you from God's Word, I want to share with you seven reasons why I believe we need community and what community does for people, okay? And if you want to take some notes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little suggestion, okay? There's seven of them. So if you want to write down the points and the scripture, then you have seven days ahead of you that you can think upon these things a little bit more, if you want, N no pressure. Or maybe if you want to spend a little bit more time with each passage of scripture, maybe you have seven weeks ahead of you and you can take one for each week. But I would like to encourage you to, to consider maybe jotting down a couple of notes and spending some time because each one of these passage of, passages of scripture could be a sermon in itself. So seven reasons why I believe we desperately need community. Reason number one, and I'll try to uh, repeat it a couple of times so that you can get it if you want to write it down. Number one, community challenges you to be more like Jesus. Community challenges you to be more like Jesus. And if you have a Bible, you can turn in it with me if you want, or you can write it down and look at it later. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 tells us how community teaches us to be more like Jesus. It says, Starting in verse 24, it says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and even the more as the day is approaching, the day being that great return of Jesus, for which I think we all are waiting. Community teaches us how to be more like Jesus, as we encourage one another in his ways. Number two, community meets our practical needs. Community meets our practical needs. Have you ever met people uh, who aren't a part of community and find themselves up a crick without a paddle? 
You see, I've never found myself in that kind of a situation. I've had hard times, but I've never found myself where I consider myself to be up a creek without a paddle because I have community. I have people that I can rely on. And in Acts chapter uh, 2, verses 42 through 47, I'm not going to read all of that, but Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, tells us about the early church. The church just after Jesus ascended back to heaven. And in Acts chapter 2, we discover that community met each other's needs. One of of my favorite, absolute favorite things about being a Seventh-day Adventist is that no matter where I go in the world, literally the world, I've traveled a lot, and I say this with a great deal of confidence, no matter where I go in the world, I have a community that cares about me and will meet my needs when I need it. Isn't that beautiful? Community is there to meet practical needs. Number three, community carries you emotionally. I want you to turn, if you have a Bible, to Galatians chapter 6. I always wonder why I use this Bible because the pages are so close together and it's so hard to find what I'm looking for. You ever find that with a Bible? Oh, they all stick together. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. I know a lot of Seventh-day Adventists who like to be law keepers. And I think that's a good thing, to keep the law of Christ. And in Galatians chapter 6, it tells us how to do it. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I could spend a lot of time talking about carrying each other's burdens. I'm not going to do that. Number four, Community opens your eyes to the needs of others. Community opens your eyes to the needs of others. If you have a Bible, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It tells us, And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. It's an amazing thing when we come together as a community and we begin to discover what the people around us need. And when you're not a part of community, you don't get to share the needs that you have because you have nobody to share it with. But it's a wonderful thing to come together and to be able to lift one another up for the cause of Christ. Number five, community meets our need for love. And my favorite book of the Bible is the book of 1 John. 1 John is is my favorite book of the Bible. And in 1 John... Uh, chapter chapter 5, uh, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, we read this, and this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Community is there to meet our need for love. And I think that there are some who think that when they get married and they have that one person, that love is complete and it's done. And it's just not true. Is it married, folks? 
It's good to have other people who help us out with love, isn't it? Number six, community teaches you to work through conflict. And I've heard a lot of people say, I'd rather just not deal with conflict. And that's why I keep away from people. Have you met people like that? I know people like that. In fact, some of them I know really well. It's easier to just not have conflict in my life. But here's the thing about conflict. Conflict is, if dealt with correctly, a beautiful thing. Because it's individualism coming together for common purpose, if it's dealt with well. And the fact that we have the opportunity to resolve conflict with one another means that we have now been able to act within our individualism as the people that God, have, God has created us to be, but then also work towards unity in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 talks about this kind of unity that Jesus is looking for. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. And I would encourage you, if you don't write anything else down, to write down that particular verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and spend some time in serious Bible study on that particular verse. And here's why. At face value... This verse can seem to say to simply agree with those around you and be happy, happy, go lucky. Okay? That's what it can look like at face value. But I want you to know that when you study that verse, you will find that that's not what God calls us to do. God has created every single one of us as individuals in his image. But there is a way that we can express our individualism while being in harmony with those around us. I hear in the Seventh-day Adventist church a lot of talk about being united, being in unity. And I am in full agreement with that, but I don't think it means what some people think, think it means. Is that fair enough to say? But let us learn to work through conflict and to live together in the unity that Jesus intends. And then finally, number seven, community gives you the chance to forgive. Community gives you the chance to forgive. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, Peter writes, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Forgiveness can't be done without love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory for, and the power forever and ever. Amen. Community gives us the opportunity to practice forgiveness. I remember one of the first times that I began to discover this particular passage in Hebrews chapter 12, talking about this great cloud of witnesses, this community of faith that I can be a part of. I remember one of the first times that I practically remember experiencing it. I realized at that moment that I had experienced it all of my life in the little country church that I had grown up in in the Walla Walla Valley, but it was a particular experience in the country of Guatemala that I began to really realize what community, community could do for a person when they, when they engage with it. The reason why is because I had been given the job of planning and executing a mission trip. And there was one place in the world that I didn't want to go to on this mission trip. And it was the country of Guatemala. And there's actually no good reason for that. But I'll, 
with a little bit of shame and embarrassment, I'll tell you the reason why I didn't want to go to Guatemala. I didn't want to go to Guatemala because the guy who had done this job the year before me at the Upper Columbia Conference office had taken a group to Guatemala. And he was one of my best friends, and I didn't want to look like I had to do what he did because he had done it. You know? So I was not going to take a group to Guatemala. And so my boss told me, you have three months to figure out what you're going to do. And after three months, if you don't have something better figured out, you're taking a group to Guatemala. I thought, oh, three months. Psh, easy. Easy peasy. I got this in the bag. So I began planning and searching, and planning, and nothing worked out. And after three months, I found myself taking a group of about 65 high school students to the country of Guatemala. And let me tell you, I was ticked. Now, I found out that I love the people of Guatemala, and Guatemala is a wonderful country. I, I've been there now a dozen times, okay? But I was super upset that I was going to Guatemala because that's where Tyler had gone. And I don't want to do it. Tyler did. And with, again, some shame, I will tell you that for the first half of that trip, I was in a terrible mood. I was one unhappy group leader. Now, for the most part, I put my happy face on, and I didn't let anybody know. But this had affected me so deeply that literally every night I went to bed crying. For the first week, I was ticked. Nothing was going right. Nothing was going the way Tyler had done it. And I went to bed every night literally crying. And one day, a man named Jim, Jim Bechtel. Jim Bechtel was about 80 years old probably. He had lived in Guatemala for a number of years as a missionary. And Jim Bechtel told me, I want you to come with me. And I went with him. And he taught me, of all the absurd things that somebody could teach a preacher, was how to pull teeth. I know, dangerous. I've pulled about 300 teeth now in my life, and I actually enjoy it. So any loose wigglers out there, come to me. Okay. He went and taught me how to pull teeth. He took me and only one other person I don't even remember who the other person was. And we went out to a, a very remote village while the rest of the group did the project that we were all there to do, to build this church. He took me out to this remote village, and he simply gave me instructions on how to pull teeth. Jim was not a man of many words. He had told me a couple of stories about the hundreds of times that he had driven trucks from Washington State down to Guatemala. He told me a few of those stories. He had told me a story about how a man had jumped out in front of him trying to commit suicide as he was driving across the country of Mexico. The man was hit and injured, not killed, and Jim found himself in, in jail in Mexico, not sure where he was going to end up next. Jim had a lot of stories, and I, I wish I could have learned more before he passed away. But on that particular day, Jim became a part of my cloud of witnesses because he showed me what faith in Jesus looks like in action. He showed me what it was like to live in community and to love and care for the people around me. I had known all of these things in theory, and I had even known those things in practice. But he had seen me for that week behind the scenes being a grump. And so on that day, I discovered a community of faith that I was a part of and people coming out of the woodwork because they wanted to experience what it was like to be a part of that community. I pulled a tooth, or maybe two or three, I can't remember, of an eight-year-old boy. He spoke no English. I spoke no Spanish. He was in a lot of pain because his teeth were rotting out, and I pulled his teeth, and the next evening... I was at Vacation Bible School about 10 miles away from where I had pulled this kid's teeth, and I found him. He, he, no, that's not true. He found me, and he came up, and he smiled with his big toothless grin. And so I went and quickly got a translator, and I said, who did you come with, your mom, your dad, your grandparents? No, he said, I came by myself. 
10 miles away. I said, how did you get here? Did you take a taxi? Did somebody bring you on a motorcycle? He said, no, I walked. Why? Why would he do that? Because he wanted to know more about my community. Because I had become a part of his. He wanted to know what it was that made me tick, that what made the people that I was with do what they were doing. So on this Sabbath day, I hope that every one of you, as you leave this sanctuary, and as you look around at the people next to you, behind you, in front of you, as you eat together at potluck, and as you play together and work together throughout the week, I want you to recognize that you belong to a community of faith that if you let it, will make every difference in your experience with Jesus. I want you to take some time this week to reflect on the people in your life who are a part of your cloud of witnesses, the people have, who have showed you that faith in Jesus is a powerful thing and that he can carry us through with our eyes fixed on him. And lastly, I want you through this week to consider the people around you who look to you as a part of their cloud of witnesses, as someone who points them to Jesus, and then with a prayer on your lips, ask God how you can do that faithfully. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for the people who have gone before, people like my grandma, people like Jim, and many others. Lord, I know each one of us right now is probably thinking of a name, of a person in our lives who has gone before us and who has shown us something of how beautiful you are. And Jesus, I want to ask a blessing on each person here that together we can grow as a community of believers, as people who are faithfully waiting for your second coming, but who are doing it together for your sake and for your glory, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.